Welcome to the Authentic Change Podcast. I'm Mike Horn, your host. And this podcast is for leaders and coaches who need and want fresh perspectives on what it means to live and to lead authentically. You're a leader who wants to make a difference, but sometimes you feel stuck. You know there's more to life and to leadership than what you're currently experiencing. It can be tough to figure out how to grow as a leader. You might be reading all the blogs and books, but it still feels like you're not making progress. You might even be feeling like you're doing everything wrong. On Authentic Change with Mike Horn, we interview experts who share their insights on how to live and lead authentically. Our guests are trendsetters in building great leaders, teams, and organizations. We provide fresh perspectives on what it means to live with purpose and authenticity. Welcome to this episode of the Authentic Change Podcast. Welcome to this episode of the Authentic Change Podcast with Mike Horn. I am absolutely delighted to have in our virtual studio today, Gina Riley. And Gina might describe herself as a human resources professional, but she's a lot more than that. She's a person who's sitting at this convergence of career coaching, executive search, and just so much more. And so I'm going to let her explain what all of that means. One of the things I'm so excited that we'll have an opportunity to discuss today is career velocity. And uh, Gina is, uh, as you know, as uh, hopefully our guests and our audience will know, she's an authority in career transition, and she is the creator of this career velocity system, which helps leaders and executives map out a transition strategy to last throughout their career. Now, that's pretty powerful work. Uh, So I'm delighted uh, that we'll talk about that. We'll uh, maybe have a chance to talk about certified UMAP coaching, uh, which Gina uses. Uh, But her clients span uh, across uh, the United States, perhaps across the globe. And uh, she helps people to connect familiar dots in new ways and helps people to pull back the kimono or pull back the curtain uh, to share unseen processes and unheard conversations from a um, recruiter's perspective, from a search professional's perspective. So again, just so delighted to uh, be with Gina and uh, uh, have her on this episode of the Authentic Change Podcast. Gina, can you say a few words about yourself, please? Yes, thanks. You did such an amazing job. Uh, Thank you for that. I do sit at the convergence of this career coaching, executive search, and interview skills training. Because what I one of my other hats is I go into corporate and uh, through Talents Group Executive Search, we teach um, a six-hour interview skills training to help anyone who is interviewing other people how to craft effective questions um, and how to probe and listen and and uncover skills. And I use that expertise to reverse engineer it for my coaching clients who are in career transition. And like you mentioned, the career velocity system that I developed is holistic and it takes people through a process of all the the storytelling that they need to build in order to be able to clearly articulate that in in interviews and with decision makers. Gina, that's so great. What's your story? I mean, how would you describe yourself uh, in terms of what brought you to this uh, this very rich uh, vein of work in human resource development, uh, this convergence that you work on. Thanks. Um, you know, I, I can trace all the way back to age 16 when I was in leadership development programs that communication was going to be my sweet spot. So my lane that I have selected from a very early age is helping people communicate better so that they can connect better and build better relationships. And that can be personally, it can be professionally, um, but I'm kind of about that succinct communication. And that uh, helps your clients, I I assume, in some enormous ways when they're involved in this process of uh, search and uh, transition Mm -hmm. or looking for the next move in their career. Absolutely. Well, the 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 great thing about doing a few executive searches once in a while is I'll, I'll, I'll interview many leaders. And I get to see where people do well and they shine and win the job. I've been in the boardroom when they're doing finalist presentations and I see which one blows it or doesn't do as well. And the other one that wins it, I see it happening. And I also am on Zoom interviewing people. So I'm able to use some of the storytelling anonymously 
um, in my coaching practice because I've seen where people don't do it so well. Yes, uh, there's so many uh, issues to explore there. I have a one client right now um, who rambles. And he, she, or they really want the next big promotion in their organization. And we're working on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what I'm curious about. I'm curious about this idea of transition. I'm a big, big Bill Bridges fan. Uh, oh, me too. Uh, Huge. And, I recommend his books all the time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I was lucky enough to do some work with him. Uh, so uh, certified oh. in uh, management of organizational transition and uh, individuals in transition. And as you know, you know, what Bill says said was that it's not so much that we're so in love with the past that we can't let go of it. Mm -hmm. We're so afraid of the future that we can't embrace a new order. It's what happens in between that gets us stuck. And where do you find some of the, you know, derailers are for, you know, successful people you're coaching? I mean, these are people who, uh, you know, have done well. Oh, my gosh. Well, first of all, we're like minded on the bridges uh, material. I didn't get to work with Bill, um, but I was also certified in my early days at Intel because we had so much churn. Sure. There was a number of us that were certified to help people through organizational transitions, <laughs> you know, um, there are many things that derail people in the career transition process, um, ranging from, I can't tell my story. So they get stuck or they miss fire and they burn out their networking connections. Um, there's also the misguided notion that the resume is going to fix everything. If I have a great resume, then a job is going to fall out of the sky and land in my lap. The exact one I want that matches my values and my passion that could not be further from the truth. Um, there's also, you know, the psychological factors that hold people back, like the disbelief in themselves. Um, there could be things that they're doing communication wise or with their executive presence that disallow them to show up in a powerful way. So I could take this conversation in like so many different directions. It is so poignant to see so many talented, smart executives who um, hold themselves uh, back or that self-critic is just so powerful mm -hmm. uh, in terms of next steps and uh, in leading. So it really leads to a question, which I think will be of great interest to everyone in our audience is what are some of the best ways to prepare for executive interviews? Yeah, well, I definitely have answers to that. Um, that's, that's what I've done with my career velocity system. So right. What I first do with folks um, is I start with them, the person. Um, and I use, like you mentioned, the UMAP career profile assessment. And what that does is that gives me a holistic view of each person I work with. I get their top five strengths from StrengthsFinder, and I build a narrative about it in a first person voice for them based on the debrief we do, not based on Gallup's like speak. Sure. If you will. I learn about their top values. I learn about their top motivated skills and the things that burn them out. And I learn about their personality. So the personality assessment, Kristen Cherry, the author of UMAP, uses um, the Holland because it's careers related. We, you know, And that would be akin to MBTI, Myers-Briggs, DISC. Sure. It's only one pillar of career satisfaction. So if I have someone show up and say, well... You know, I'm a red or I'm a I'm I'm an extrovert or I'm an introvert. That does not help me with their messaging. It's only one aspect. I lean really hard on the strengths because that is their natural talent. It tells me how they do what they do. That's the stuff that bleeds into the storytelling because that's what's going to show up. It shows me how they're going to initiate or lead strategy or what have you. The values tell me why they do what they do. Mm -hmm. The values is what we want to connect with, whether or not they will really connect with that organization or the people, or did they get a bad vibe that will cause them that stomach ache when they start, right? So what I'm doing is helping people start with themselves, building the storytelling. We work through a leadership model and do storytelling about their leadership approach. I use the adaptive leadership model, if you're familiar. Yeah, hi, Fitz. Um, the third thing that I do is I'm I'm having them tell me their entire career story and helping them build a synthesized narrative so they have it. Then we take all of that and we create a tell me about yourself narrative. So we break it all down into chunks that they can manage. 
bullet point by bullet point until we can get to a place where they can tell that, tell me about yourself in about four minutes, give or take. Because what I want them to do in interviews, back to your point, is to show up with the sharp tool. Cannot show up with your Swiss Army knife and say, I can do it all. I don't care how senior you are. Don't don't care if you're 40. I don't care if you're 69. If you show up and you don't explain what problem you can solve for that organization, they're not going, it's not going to land. You got to start with the sharp tool. So I'm sharpening the tool. And then we work through resume development on all the rest, like I mentioned. Yeah, it's so great though. But uh, starting with this basis of values uh, and helping people to sort through that, uh, knowing about your strengths and why is it so difficult for people to step into their strengths? I think clients often come to me with a desire to uh, fix a problem or uh, fix a deficiency. I meet very few people who arrive uh, to me saying, I, I really would like to know how to do this better. Uh, not for, I, I mean, from a, from a deficit point, yes. But <laughs> why, why, why is that? Why, is, why do you think uh, it's difficult for us to uh, soar with our strengths, as somebody said? I think it's human nature. I mean, most of us are pretty hard on ourselves, if we're being honest. Particularly um, executives, I think. But, oh, absolutely. Um, without a shadow of a doubt. Here's the thing, though. When people arrive at my doorstep and sign up with me, I am completely focusing on that future forward narrative based on how great they already are. So so I don't have any wiggle. I don't have room for all that other stuff. Now, if they are compensating for a true skill deficit, maybe it's a true leadership skill deficit, and they can kind of talk to that and they have the self-awareness, then we can talk about how they can overcome that challenge, um, you know, through the interview process. Most of the people I'm working with are pretty senior. Many will ramble, but that's not like a character thing (laughs) or, you know what I mean? It's just, they don't have the sharp tool ready and they're not using that presence of mind to adapt what they need to say in the moment to land with each set of decision makers. What are the two or three points I can make now? What's the question that I can ask so I can get some feedback uh, about others? And uh, we're going to talk about this more and folks will find it in our show notes. Uh, uh, But one of the ways to get in touch with Gina is at uh, GinaRileyConsulting.com. So I hope that uh, folks, as we explore and you think about uh, what you're going to do after you listen to the podcast, I hope you keep that top of mind to visit uh, GinaRileyConsulting.com. Because I think what Gina, you're proposing is you're talking about how people showcase themselves, Mm -hmm. uh, how they offer a uh, solution, how they position their expertise uh, in many ways. And, you know, I I worked a lot, I work a lot with uh, people who are uh, unicorns. Uh, Maybe somebody has an MD and PhD uh, in rheumatology and they're one of the 50 specialists in the United States in pediatric rheumatology, or I work with uh, MD PhDs in uh, other disease uh, areas or uh, who are pursuing new growth opportunities to combat uh, bio uh, to combat uh, uh, global climate change. So with these super technical people, um, they are authorities in their field. But how do we get normal everyday people to talk about their expertise and authority? (laughs) Well, the first thing that that one could do is to ask the people closest to them. And I'm not necessarily saying like the spouse or partner, but the people in their their colleagues. What do you what do you come to me for when you when you pick up the phone or send me an email? What is it that you're seeking from me? What's that expertise that you think of as the go to? What am I the go to for? That will be one angle to get after it. And I'll tell you, one of my talent group teammates sent me an, a text first thing this morning and said, I'm re- reconsidering my branding. What are the three things that you what are the three words you would use to describe me? It was a beautiful thing. I was like sending her stuff. She's like, well. I'm starting my day off really positively. Thank you for all the affirmation about how great I am. Um, but but that's the first indication about what you're considered an expert in. And if you don't like what you're hearing back, well, it's on you to start shaping that narrative. Maybe you need to speak up more in meetings. 
Maybe you need to write short form posts for LinkedIn and become known for something. But I recommend, you know, defining those like three things that you might, and one might be the technical expertise or functional area of expertise if I'm a marketing guru, right? All the facets of marketing under my span of control. What's my leadership approach? You know, I could be talking about anything related to leadership, building teams, you know, authenticity, whatever that thing is that you love to talk about and you want to pull people into the conversation. That's what I would recommend that you try to become known for. I love that idea of uh, collecting three words. Uh, and I've done that, you know, with strangers yeah. uh, or, uh, you know, others who know me at, uh, at, at some distance. And the words that people typically express about me are uh, calm, confident, and competent. Nice. And how about if it was you? I mean, what what would drive your? Uh, and I know I don't mean to put you on the spot with that question, but I wonder yeah. what kind of feedback you've collected to, because you you're connecting with your clients to support their success. Yeah. Well, one of the things you mentioned, like kind of in the bio tee up, is that I connect dots and in, in you know familiar dots in in new ways. And what I would say to answer your question, I don't know if they're all individual words, but my strengths finder, my number three is something called individualization. Uh -huh. That means I have the superpower of seeing every single human as their own distinct individual with a different background and perspective. And I'm considering that. So the feedback I get is, you know, people feel seen by me. I get them. Um, even though I'm an extrovert and I'm loud, I'm a very good listener. Like I'm paying it, I'm like reading all the tea leaves. <laughs> um, I also check my assumptions. I don't assume I know everything. Just because I'm coming across with a strong, bold message doesn't mean I'm always right. So, so quick. yeah, please. Yeah, I got that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's great. And, and as we think about this, I mean, when we think about the ways in which uh, people can, um, manage their transition successfully and why it's so important to manage transitions. What what advice or recommendations or guidance would you have? Uh, because uh, the world, uh, as one of my mentors, uh, uh, Daria Funches uh, said, she wrote a poem uh, that has a refrain, uh, jobs don't love people back. Uh, but I'm just thinking about so much in this, you know, it's in the painful episodes of employment, thinking about that, particularly in the technology industry, where uh, so many of um, uh, the folks I coach in technology companies, they've seen colleagues uh, leave in the last uh, month or so. Mm -hmm. So how are you thinking about that uh, in your work? Yeah. Um, the way that I think about it goes back to our, you know, where we, we're talking about William Bridges' work. Mm -hmm. um, people, people need to recognize that there is an evolution that they need to go through if they're going to come out on the other side and be able to put a positive face forward for the future. And it, it, you know, you you can probably tell this better than me, but you know, some of those stages is a little bit like the grieving process when we lose a loved one. There's that shock, disbelief, and then anger. And then, you know, there's, you know, you're trying to like process it and reason through it. And then ultimately you get, you go through the mock and the grief so you can rise out into a new beginning and, and, and face a new day. And so when I'm working with people who are feeling the emotions of the transition, I'm having them buy the personal transitions book so that they can understand psychologically what's happening, acknowledge it. And, and embrace it because if you don't, you risk putting a negative foot forward. You may badmouth your former employer. People are not going to welcome that. They need to know what your sharp tool is. By the time you get to the doorstep of the new opportunity, you need to have your Swiss Army knife ready and the sharp tool out. Yes, and as many of our listeners uh, uh, who lead executive search or participate in an executive search in their firms and you know, from my own experience uh, working on the other side of the table, uh, hiring search firms, working with search uh, executives, uh, the last thing I probably wanted to hear about was 
the last company because the search professional had done all that homework. We had already briefed about meeting with candidates and you know who was on the uh, shortlist. So we were always well. The executive teams that I've le- uh, that I've participated on, I think we were generally always well prepared to uh, meet a candidate for a CXO role. Uh, so it's so important. I love what you're saying. And it's one of the things that I try to bring to client situations is that for folks who are in a transition is conveying a sense of hope um, that, mm. you know, this is not the end of the world. Uh, be thankful for your health. Be thankful for your emotional ability. Be thankful for your intellectual health. Mm-hmm. The job will recover at some point. Mm-hmm. You've got to do the work. You have to do uh, the work. You got to do the work. And it can be so helpful in, t- I, I think, what's a complex uh, job market today for people to have uh, someone like yourself. And people can find out more about you at Gina Riley Consulting.com. Um, um, to be, um, to present yourself in a way that is authentic and true and uh, helps you to ultimately deliver on those promises inside an organization. Mm-hmm. Um, so how important is um, um, the way that candidates uh, win job offers? I mean, what are, what are some of the things that you see happening? It's a combination of um, authenticity, like showing up as in a way that people believe that they're going to, what they see now is what they will get down the, the line. The real deal. Right. And the stories that they're telling ring true so that they're 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 bringing that with them. And that's that's come, becoming a reality. Um, so that's that's one aspect. When I've been in the room, when the CEO has won the job, you know, they're competing for a CEO job. It, it's that little bit of like personal, just enough to say I'm a real human being. Here's some of the mentors I had in my life here. You know, these are the people I've mentored and helped grow their careers. I'm really proud of that. Here might be a, here's a few nuggets, maybe about my family, just so you can see me. As Enough a to make the person accessible. Exactly. And we're not talking, we're talking three slides. Boom, boom, boom. Here's what, you know, I mountain bike on the weekends. You know, I have a, I have a special needs child. And so I volunteer in that regard, whatever it is, right. Then, then you shift into, here's what I've learned about the organization. I've had 20 conversations. And here's the here's the five highlights. These are the things that you're focused on as you've told me. And then as we shift into the future, here's some things that I think that I could be doing with you. And in the first 90 days, you can expect this from me. So there's many things you can do to connect, but you got to connect as a human because people just aren't having it anymore. <laughs> you know, you got to show up and be a real person um, and you got to balance the I'm a per, I'm a human with the strength and the strategy strategy and the and the vision and and give people the belief that they that you're a person that they want to follow. You're so right. And let's talk a little more about presence. Uh, we've talked about hope, you know, so important for me uh, to bring a sense of hope to the engagements uh, in which I participate. But the other thing that I talk about is presence is uh having a sense of presence. And the third thing I talk about is discernment. Let's figure out what we're working on and what's not work here. And uh, Because I, I, my clients are goal-directed people. And uh, we're going to, to be an effective coach, it's helpful if your client has a goal. Yeah. To achieve. So let's talk about executive presence though, because I think it's uh, in many ways such a uh, um, my notes. misaligned okay. uh, term. So how do you think about it? Yeah. So I, I use, I, I've done some writing about executive presence, and I, I base that off of the work of Sylvia Ann Hewlett. Oh, sure. Um, and so there's these three aspects. Um, there's appearance, there's communication, and there's gravitas. Those are the three elements. Appearance is the first hurdle that all of us have to kind of overcome, but it's t- we're talking like 250 milliseconds of like the first impression. Um and different things about us, some of the things we can't change. I can't change that, you know, I'm a woman over 50 and I'm going to look a certain way. And there's certain things that I can't do, but there's certain things I can do in how I dress, not being too young, not being too fuddy-duddy, whatever that is. There's things that I can control and there's things I cannot control. A man can't control that he is shorter than the average man. That's not going to change. For example, moving into communication. 
there's like six or seven aspects of communication and how we communicate. You know, looking at that, figuring out which ones she outlines, which ones are the most important and, and seeing where you rate. And then the third thing, the most important is gravitas. And again, six or seven aspects of gravitas. This is reading the room. Do you have the ability to walk into a situation and scan the room and modify and adapt your behavior so that you land with people? Um, For our regular listeners, uh, they'll know that uh, several episodes ago, we had uh, Joel Gar- Garfink was a guest on Executive Presence about stepping into your power, conveying mm-hmm. confidence, uh, and leading with conviction. And uh, one of the things that Joel uh, uh, says is, uh, it, it, it's what you just identify, is that how do you radiate gravitas uh, yeah. in executive presence? How do you act with authority? Uh, which is, you know, I think one of the things that you're working on, and then how do you express yourself fully? And I love some of the uh, tips and guidance that, that you're providing about how to do that. Um, but so, since so many of our uh, members of our audience are uh, either in transition or they're people who are helping others who are in transition, they're coaches, mm-hmm. they're consultants, they're human resources people and culture leaders. Mm-hmm. What do you think are some of the you know key elements uh, that help people to have an effective career transition plan? Well, I, if I could reverse engineer, where I see it going wrong and south is when companies are doing these large layoffs like that we're hearing about, and it's really great if they can get an outplacement package. But I mean, it's 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 something. The challenge can be, uh, especially at the executive level, and I've had this experience where someone has come and hired me six months later because they're not getting the traction. And part of the, maybe to your point to answer it, is not starting with that resume. You've got to start with your storytelling and understand what you're even going to communicate in the first place. Do you know your unique value proposition? What are the top results you know how to get for an organization? How do you help companies? How do you help people? And so one challenge when when I've seen people go to outplacement first is they'll, they'll, they'll mock up a resume. It will look good. It may not have all the key results, but it'll look pretty. Um, but but I've had an executive told, go out and start networking immediately. But that person was inside the same company for 25 years. So they don't, their network internally cannot help them anymore. They've gotten laid off. Their external network are a handful of leaders that also got let go. Now they're competing for similar jobs. That's pretty. And I've, no, I've seen this happen uh, recently. Dog, eat dog, right? Um, some of them, you know, are references for each other, but then get pulled into the recruiting process. And suddenly now they're actually their competition. This is like real stuff. So you have to get centered on your own storytelling and unique value proposition. So you don't have to worry about, you know, all of that. Stay measured in your approach. Use a job search strategy that works. Do not spray and pray. If you bother to spend your time to apply to a job that you see visibly online, you should be immediately networking toward decision makers and using a measured plan to do that. You do not just apply because you're probably not going to get a call. And it's amazing how generous you are, Gina, with your material and what you've, uh, what you're learning, and how you're staying at the edge of your field. And what I love about that generosity is that people, um, you have available a masterclass series that people can find on GinaRileyConsulting.com, uh, which talks about why executives need a career transition plan and what are the moving parts of a ca- career transition. Uh, strategy. And uh, tell us a little bit about those and how do people find out more about that, uh, yeah. those topics? Yeah. So at the top of my website, Gina Riley Consulting, there's a green button. You click on that and you download a free webinar. It's 30 minutes. The first 15 says, why do you need a transition plan? The second 15 minutes is an outline of what I use in Career Velocity. And you can print a workbook. You have to check your spam folder, but you get a workbook you can print and you can actually start noodling out some of your ideas. And this is where people go, oh, okay, I can see that I'm missing like eight things before I start the resume. Usually when I'm talking with people about uh, careers, what I'm often asking them is, is a big question about how they want to direct the significance of their life. 
Mm. And uh, because so many hours are spent in uh, uh, work and leading others and being challenged by others and all the things that come with executive roles and organizations. Um, so when you place executives, I mean, or not when you place executives, but when you help one of your clients mm-hmm. who, and the result is a job that uh, after the first 100 days, they're still satisfied, they're still happy, uh, everybody's happy. Um, <laughs> what what really resonates for you at that moment? I mean, uh, it, it's got to be somewhat reinforcing, self-reinforcing for the kind of work that you do. Oh, it's a blast when they land. Like getting, having even two, like the trifecta is two or three offers, right? At the same time, that's crazy fun. Um, but you know, it takes, this takes a lot of work. And so when they get that offer and they're, and they're happy that they get to move forward and start something fresh and new, it's great. I will say that, you know, there's no perfect company, there's no perfect organization. And so, you know, when I touch back with them, sometimes things are awesome. And sometimes they're like, well, this one wasn't really what I thought it was going to be, but I'm learning this, you know? So I've come to accept that I, you know, I can't control everything (laughs) for them, but, um, that at least they're getting movement and they're not stuck and they they have all the moving parts people never need to rehire me because they have the moving parts unless they want to come back for interview prep and that's very specific very everything specific, else they right. have it it's and so i would say in- the one thing people don't do this is kind of sad uh-huh. most people do not continue forward with the thought leadership plan and What's the limitation of doing that or, or not advancing uh, or making progress with your thought leadership plan? There's a, there's a, a, plenty of things. The first would be time. I don't have uh-huh. time. Um, or it's a little bit personality driven where the, maybe there's like that introvert or there could be, well, that might not look humble, you know, different things like that. But here's the thing. Whatever you're sought out for in the first place, place your your area of expertise and authority, those are the things you need to double down on if that's what you want to be known for. I have had some people shift and say, well, I don't want to be known for my past functional area of expertise. I'm trying to shift. Great. What are those three things? How will you be found in the future? Does not have to be a TED Talk. It could be it could be commenting on other people's things on LinkedIn and fanning other people's flames and building a community of like-minded people. I love what you say, uh, you know, in terms of how you uh, help people about helping um, uh, your next executive role find you. Yeah. I love that. Uh, <laughs> it's a great series. Way of thinking about uh, your work uh, and how you take this adjacent territory around uh, leadership topics and and blend it into your work uh, so that you think about leadership storytellers, adaptation and leadership, uh, what's important uh, for executives during the search. And, and then I think you have the more tactical aspects of interview prep, branding, telling your career story. Mm-hmm. I, I say in some ways they're tactical, but they're really quite strategic as you think about how you want to show up it's in the world. And bolts. It's the moving parts though. You're right. It's Yeah. yeah. And so much of this happens with uh, networking, as you identified, that we see people in roles for 10 or 15 or perhaps longer, and their network really develops internally, at, and they're at risk of uh, you know, not having a broader network when opportunities arise. And yeah. where I find it also particularly um, uh, distracting or or is that when you enter a search and you're in a company and you're looking for you know people to fill critical roles and you don't have a network uh, to reach out to and to you know help the search professional say hey you know this company's doing some amazing things here why don't we look for some talent there or, you know something to that effect absolutely well you bring up a really good point which is like a lot of the leaders part of the strategy that you know we take if they're looking to break into like maybe a startup or, or, or a company that's about to like really pop and, and, and execute on something new and get bigger is developing relationships with investors. So that's VC and PE firms. So I interviewed not quite for the same series, how your next executive role finds you, but kind of adjacent is um, I, 
you know, in talking to these investors, they're like, it's my job. Part of my job is to know people and have people on a virtual bench. Does it mean they hire those people? Absolutely not. But they're advising a whole swath of CEOs and executive teams. So that CEO comes to them and says, hey, Bill, you know, my CFO is going to leave. Oh, okay. Well, I, I just talked to a CFO last week and I know these other three. I'm going to send you their names, check them out, see if you want to reach out. You know, these are connectors. It's so important to have because I think that, you know, at least every, one, every 10 days, one of the questions I have from someone is, do you know someone who... Sure. And, uh, you know, I may not know anyone directly in a particular uh, narrow field that they're looking for, but I, I might have a network of colleagues. Uh, and I think it's a way that we develop relationships over time with people. And that's what I like to think about in terms of career development is that it's not the next job. It's the career that you're really growing and developing so that you can bring your best and bring more of who you are to what you do. That's a good point. It's a continuum. So if you see it as a journey, kind of that age old, you know, maybe tired phrase of life is a journey, not a destination. You see your career and your professional life as like this continuum that you're evolving and growing and developing and you have missteps and misfires and you learn and you go, that's not it. I'm going to try this. Then it doesn't have to be such a big crater effect when we have a bump in the road. It's so great. And, uh, you know, what I love about uh, your work is that it's really grounded in uh, in your experience. I mean, the work that you did on uh, employer branding uh, for big companies, the uh, work that you've done uh, across uh, uh, the planet. It, it's so great to know that, uh, as your clients say, um, that you you really step into uh, helping uh, others to pursue their dreams and to pursue their passions, not only to pursue them, uh, but to attain them as well. I, I'm activating them. That's my number one strength is activator. <laughs> uh -huh. That's <laughs> so, great. You know, I'm activating them and I'm getting them. I'm I'm like the the spark underneath, you know. <laughs> and Gina, we've mentioned it a few times, but uh, folks can certainly find out more about you on Gina Riley Consulting.com. It's a great site with lots of information about the uh, Gina and the products and services uh, and the clients that uh, she serves. If you were to offer, you know, we're still at the beginning of the year, we're still, um, you know, thinking about uh, changes in the economy, particularly in tech. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the one or two pieces of advice if someone's feeling uncertain in their job, thinking about a next step? Um, what would you tell them to pay attention to? Oh, gosh. Um... I think paying attention to your industry, read the tea leaves, like you need to read industry information. If you're worried, you need to be looking at the industry as a whole, the competitor, doing your own like competitor analysis, maybe having conversations with management too, and getting their perspectives. Um, I think a better informed person and not um, hiding under the covers and ignoring it will serve you better. So you can make a strategic plan to buffer yourself from any any headwinds that come along, you know, the way. So um, that is probably the top thing that I would think about. Now, what I will say is, um, and I haven't published this on my website as of yet, but I did a series of five articles building up um, how a, a person would position themselves for a COO role. And it was based on research from um, HBR and EY and the competencies. And my fifth article was a, it was like a, a guide to how do you uncover your skill gaps? What conversations should, should you have? What education and experiences do you need? And what I found is this guide is actually a really great guide for any functional area of expertise. You can modify it. I'll eventually modify it when I have time and make it a little more generic, but it's, re, and it's, you know, I pulled in expert advice and have it all quoted in there, but it's a really cool guide. And that's the kind of thing that can help people go, what am I missing in, in my purview right now? It's so, great to, uh, so great to have been in conversation today with uh, Gina Riley, the uh, an authority in career transition, the creator of the career velocity system um, that helps people, that helps executives to map out transition strategies that are career lasting. 
And that's uh, pretty amazing work, uh, Gina. Um, so again, I'd like to uh, encourage all of our audience uh, to visit GinaRileyConsulting.com. And uh, Gina, I'd like to thank you. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the Authentic Change podcast with Mike Horn. So until the next episode, all of uh, listeners, uh, old and new, uh, stay well. Thank you for listening to the Authentic Change podcast. I'm delighted that you've tuned in to listen. Please visit the show notes for links to topics discussed in today's podcast. To download a free ebook on authentic change and leadership and to subscribe to my newsletter, please visit mike-horn.com. Once again, m-i-k-e-h-o-r-n-e.com, mike-horn.com. Once again, thank you for listening to the Authentic Change Podcast.